So tonight is the seventh of Cheshvan, and it is the time when people begin praying for rain in Israel. Mm-hmm. The reason they wait to pray for rain till tonight, even though Israel could have used the rain a while ago, is because the um, the Torah says you're not supposed to pray for rain until the last Jew arrives home after his visit to Jerusalem for the holiday. So it takes two weeks, fifteen days. For the last guy to get back home, wow. he the last one who lives the farthest from Jerusalem lives in um, across the Euphrates River, and so everyone in Israel can't pray for rain, even on the last day he's coming home. The six or seven is when he when he arrives home. No one can pray for rain until the last guy gets home. And it tells us a lot about um, how the Torah views every individual, or every individual matters, and you can't write off someone and say, "Ah, just one person." But everyone, the whole Jewish people can't pray for rain because there's still one guy traveling home and it's not like one guy is suffering, one guy is, is, is in, it just, it just, 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 we don't want him to get wet. We don't want him to get wet when he's driving home and it's just one day, it's a couple of hours, it's, it's in the, you know, everyone, the whole Jewish people, everyone's waiting for this last guy to come home. And it highlights the idea of Avas Yisrael, of caring for the other Jew, and also highlights the idea of how powerful every individual is. The story just happened to me. I mean, this last uh, last Friday really brings us home. Last Friday, I was went to the uh, mikveh uh, on Reeves over there, and which Baruch Shem Rebbeil took care of this mikveh for many many years, and so uh, stand for you for all good. So. The, um, there's a gentleman parked over there and he's looking at me. Oh. And he's like, why aren't you looking at me? It's a little bit of a peculiar question to ask at the mikvah, but this was outside the mikvah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, yeah, outside yeah. the mikvah, why aren't you looking at me? Oh, okay. So I said, and he, and he continues. He said, I know, why you're not, I know why you're not looking at me. You're not looking at me because he's not psychotic. I know this guy, he's not psychotic. Oh. This guy is, is, is a sensitive soul. Mm-hmm. And and I think he was right when he said I wasn't looking at him. I didn't I didn't I didn't, I didn't make eye contact with him. So the reason you make eye contact with me, I think he says, because you asked me for something eight years ago. I asked him to help with a certain mitzvah eight years ago. And it was a, it was significant cost for this mitzvah to get it done, and he couldn't afford it. But he said I really could have afforded it, and I said no to you, and I wanted to say yes. But I didn't have the courage to say yes, and I was, and I was, um, and I stopped myself from saying yes. And I feel he said that by not doing that mitzvah, I sort of lost an opportunity Hashem sent me, and that's why um, the business that I that he had then, the property, the it, it was all the bracha went away and the property and, and 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 this is on his mind for eight years, and he said I thought about this many many times. Mm. So I'm looking at him, and unbeknownst to him, another story happened related to this gentleman. Let's call him Yankel. Um, I went around the block uh, last year before Sukh- uh, during on Sukkot to offer actually it was Rosh Hashanah. I have to offer Jews the opportunity to hear the shofar near, near my home, and one um, one guy hears the shofar, and he called me a few weeks later. Unfortunately, his father passed away in the interim. He called me and he said, uh, Rabbi, I need your help. This guy Yankel owes us money. Yankel owes us money, and um, maybe you could speak to him. It's like, why would Yankel listen to me? I'm thinking, why would Yankel listen to me? I mean, what do I have to do with Yankel? I, I, I once, I mean, I, I have nothing to do with Yankel. If anything, I know the Yankel is, that, that, that Yankel wouldn't want to hear from me. You have to ask someone, you have a dispute about an argument, about a debt. I'm not the guy. He's like, listen, Rabbi, we need someone to, to call. Please, you call. And I was thinking, like, there's no point in me calling. And I, I refused. I didn't make the call. I didn't make the call. And uh, months and months go by. And uh, now I meet Yankel um, outside the mikvah. And Yankel tells me the story. And I said to him, Yankel, I want to tell you something. I was going to call you about this the issue, but I felt that we didn't have this kind of relationship. But now you're opening up to me and you're telling me how 
had the conversation. I want to tell you what's going on. There is this debt, and the, and 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 the, it, 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 their, their people are, are really um, they're really hurting because it's, it really bothers them. And he said, oh, well, I want to pay them back, but I'm afraid." <laughs> so I'm like, "Ankle, ankle, don't be afraid." That was the first issue. The first issue was years ago. You want to do something and you're afraid. Don't. Hashem, you just said Hashem doesn't want you to be afraid. Don't be afraid, and and pay the guy back. He said, I can't afford it. I have all this stuff going on. I don't know if I could do it. I don't know if I, it's all this money. I, I I have so many things going on. I have some things. I, I can't. You know what's going on in my life. He shows me his eviction notices from his house because of uh, money and this and that. I'm like, listen, Yanko, don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. And and do something. You can't pay all of it right now, okay? But do something. He says, okay, Rabbi, I'll try. I want to do something. That's what he says. I want to do something. Okay. That's what his ankle says. He called, I, he called me now tonight and he said that he had a certain item that was worth a significant amount of money. He couldn't sell it. And just now, just this week, he's able to sell it. And he's going to give all the money. I think it's like hundred thousand dollars, a third of the debt that he owes. And I, I, I'm going to give all this money to pay for my debt. And I want to thank you, Rabbi, because now I'm going to, I'm going to do this, and I'm happy I'm doing this. So I said to the ankle, I said, I want to tell you what, what I feel. It says in the Talmud, a good thought Hashem connects to an action. I said you felt that you wanted to do this mitzvah, paying back the debt. You want to do this mitzvah. And Hashem orchestrated things to happen in your life so you should be able to pay back this debt. You, you had this property, you had this item, whatever it was, and you couldn't, um, you couldn't sell it, you couldn't make it into, into money, but as soon as you decide you want to pay back the debt, Hashem caused this to be sold, and now you're Baruch Hashem able to pay, pay, back the, um, pay back at least part of the debt. So Yankel was, he was really like, we, we, had, we had this conversation, he was really like, he was crying. It was it was it was a real um, it was a heartfelt conversation, and and I, honestly, it was it was something that, that taught me something. Like I, I didn't realize about myself that I that I that I harbored ill feeling to Yankel all this time because of, but he sensed it, and uh, and, and I think he was right. I think that that I wasn't so um, I didn't want to meet his eyes maybe because of what happened eight years ago. Maybe I was also you know disillusioned. Um, but the point really is in regards to tonight. Tonight. Is um, the seventh of Cheshvan, and it's when the last Jew comes home, and it reminds us all how each of us is is sacred and precious in the eyes of Hashem. As the Baal Shem Tev says, every Jew to Hashem is like an only child, precious like an only child, and even more. So this is something which will give us some insight in um, in this week's Torah portion, and hopefully not just in our own lives, but in our in, in our, the lives we're meant to live, the lives we're meant to live to do the mission Hashem has entrusted us with. Imagine if you were there on October 7th, last year, on Simchas Torah. Imagine you had a gun, imagine you had a car, and you knew how to use it, and you heard what's going on in the South. Would you go down there? Some people immediately went, and they, and they rescued hundreds of people. Hmm. But would you do it? Would you go down there? You don't really know where you're going, you don't really know what you're doing, you don't know if, you could be, if you're helpful or hurtful. But, and, and, and it's not something you could be blamed for if you decide not to go, and it's not something that we could really know if we would do what we would do. We could say what we would do, we don't really know what we would do. We could hope that we'd be the ones like to know to like put everything aside and put ourselves in danger to help other Jews. We could hope we would do that, we don't really know. But it really doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what we would have, would have done, because Hashem didn't put us in that situation. And even if He did, it's a past. A, a more important question to ask instead of what, what would we have done on October 7th last year, is are we hearing the voice of Hashem right now? Hashem is asking us to do right now. What we would have done last year doesn't really matter. The question is, are we hearing the voice of Hashem now? And the, the voice of Hashem is very um, open and clear in this week's Torah portion. When the previous Rebbe was a child, he um, went to visit his father, the Rebbe Hashem. It was Friday afternoon before Pasha's Lech Lecha. And this didn't only happen one time, it happened many times. His father, his customary before Shabbos, is supposed to read the Torah portion twice with Aramaic translation. And his father is reading the, uh, reading the Torah portion. And he reads the first line. And the previous Shabbos said he felt a, a shudder in his body. His father 
cried profusely, two tears, two big tears he saw in his father's eyes. His father read the first line, Hashem spoke to Avram, he said to him, Lechacha, and he was overwhelmed with emotion. And the previous saw this, and, he, and he, thought, he, he felt like there's a call from Hashem, he was calling on, to, not just to Avram, not just about moving his location from point A to point B, but there's a deeper call, Hashem is calling us. That's what the previous Rebbe felt then as a child. And he said, that just happened once. Every his father read the, read the Torah portion, and he heard something in those words that that's, that's not, wasn't just for Avraham, but it's for each of us. Let's say it this way. Avraham wasn't unique. The Svasemis quotes the Zohar who says that the voice of Hashem, Lechlecha, go out of your birthplace, go out of your, go out of your father's house, that voice was reverberating throughout the entire universe. For quite some time before Avraham was born, and Avraham was the first one to hear the voice, but that voice was reverberating throughout the entire cosmos. And the Zohar says, but people have eyes and they don't see, have ears they don't hear. A, they, they go to sleep, but the Zohar says, in a chor, they go to sleep in some kind of hole and, and, and their eyes are, are incapable of seeing and hearing what's really going on. And instead of them hearing and seeing what's going on, Hashem is calling them, they're stuck in somewhere else. So Abba Vinu uniquely, he was able to hear Hashem's voice. Echad ha'ay Avraham. Avraham was the only one. <coughs> but we're all descendants of Avraham. Just like Avraham was the only one to hear Hashem's voice, so too we're all endowed to be the one. I was just doing carpool with my son and his friends. And I asked them, do you ever feel your soul talking to you? Do you ever feel Hashem talking to you? Do you ever feel like you know Hashem wants you to do? And you hear it inside <coughs> you. Hashem is talking to you. One boy, credible. He said, yeah, at lunchtime, today. Lunchtime, everyone ate, and then they went to play. And I felt I should go back, and I should say the after blessing, I should, I should bench. So I went back and I benched. That, 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 that's real. That's real. So that's the voice of Hashem to Avraham, which is the voice of Hashem to each of us, Lech Lecha. What does Lech Lecha mean? Hasidus explains the deeper meaning of the word Lech Lecha. Lech Lecha means go to yourself. Not go away from yourself, go to yourself. And the Rebbe explained, there's a lot of upheaval when you move from one place to another. There could be a lot of change. But if a Jew goes the way he's meant to go, the Rebbe said, so then when he moves, he doesn't go away from himself, goes deeper and closer to him, his real deepest self. Instead of going away from himself, he goes pimisticker. He goes deeper inside of himself until he reaches the essence of his neshama, until he reaches his soul. And that's the meaning of the words, go away from your land. The Hebrew word for land is the same root as the word for desires. Arzachah is the same root as the word ratzay. Shem tells Vitali, al go away from your land, go away from your desires. Go away from your birthplace. Your birthplace means your natural tendencies. Go away from your father's home. The father, according to Kabbalah, is a, is, is a root of our emotions because the intellect is the root of the emotions. So going away from your father's house means going away from your intellect, going away from your paradigms. Away from the preconceived notions about what is possible, what's not possible, what you should be doing, what you shouldn't be doing. Move away from that. Go instead to the land that I will show you to, to Hashem's desire. Because the most important thing isn't how much you measure yourself against what you should be doing. Should be doing. Measure what is Hashem asking of you? And that's why the Torah doesn't tell us anything about Adam's rich 75 years of life. The Torah ignores all that. Why Torah ignores Avram's whole past? There's so much we could talk about Avram. We could talk about, let's talk about Moshe. We know about Moshe. Moshe grew up. And when Moshe grew up, and he sacrificed himself for his brothers, and he was in the basket. We know all about, in the written Torah, it says the whole story of Moshe. It's not in the Talmud, it's not in the Medrash. It's straight in the written Torah. How come, by, for Avram Avinu, the Torah doesn't tell us anything about his whole, whole rich, rich upbringing. How he broke his father's idols. How he believed in Hashem. How he challenged the king. And the king. Why do we know about this? Because Hashem wants to tell us, Moshe, Hashem wants to tell us, listen, it doesn't matter where you were a moment ago, it doesn't matter what happened in your whole life, it doesn't matter your circumstances, as long as you want to come with Hashem, He's ready to take you. Lechacha, He's telling you to come with where you are. can't get over the story you heard um, over Yontif at the Rebbe, at uh, Daniel's house. Uh, it's Jew. He told the Rebbe, he told the Rebbe, the Rebbe asked him, how come you don't come to me? He says, I'm here. He said, where are you? He says, I'm here. The Rebbe said, why don't you come? 
He said, because I am, he, he was a, a contractor. He says, I'm almost schmutzig. I'm always dirty. So the Rebbe said, come the way you are. Come the way you are. That's the Rebbe come the way you are. So this is what Hashem tells all of us. It doesn't matter where you were a moment ago. Come the way you are. There's a mission Hashem has for you. What's the mission? The mission is lechacha. What's lechacha mean? Lechacha means to go towards, away from the living superficially and live deeper, <laughs> away from a world where the center of the world is your ego and go to a world where the center of the world is divine Hashem calling to you. When they, if a Jew gets up and he goes to rescue Jews um, in, 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 in on October 7th and he gets in his car and doesn't know what he's doing, that's Jewish. That's a Jewish, that's a meaning of being Jewish. Going to hear the voice of Hashem. That's the first thing we know about Jews are of Avram, it's the first Jew, the first thing the Torah tells us is Avram went to hear the voice of Hashem. That's what a Jew means. That you have something in you that senses the voice of Hashem. Not that you're a prophet. There was a woman. She wrote to the Rebbe, she asked the Rebbe, how can I know what Hashem wants me to do? How can I know? How can I possibly know what Hashem wants me to do? Anyone have any answers for that? The Shulchan Aruch. Yeah. The Shulchan Aruch and Chabad custom and all the books you'll read don't cover 90% of situations. Directly. Directly. Mm. Most situations you'll have to figure out yourself. And the Rebbe told her, Hashem is talking directly to your soul. And that's why they wrote this in his handwriting. Hashem is, Hashem is speaking directly to your heart, to your soul. And that's where you get good decisions. The good decisions you have in your mind, you want to do A, B, and C, because Hashem is talking to your soul. So in our, uh, in our society, one of the things we don't really get a chance to do is try to listen to that inner voice inside of us. We don't have a chance... There's a story, a beautiful story, about this gentleman who was on pension. He used to be uh, working in the Navy, and he was very proficient in Morse code. And uh, there was an advertisement that needs someone who was very proficient in Morse code. And everyone should come between 12 and 2. He needs this, this senior government position. Just someone has to be very proficient. He comes to the, uh, comes to the office a little late, you know, Jewish time. He gets there at 1 o'clock. Everyone's there at 12 o'clock. At the, and he comes in last, and, he, and, he, and he's sitting there, and he, all of a sudden he gets up. He runs to the uh, to the door to enter the office, and I was like, "You're last! How come you're coming on going in first? You're last!" And he ignores them. The secretary is like, "What are you doing? Why are you going? If there's an order, he ignores the secretary. He goes into the boss's office, and in a minute later, the boss comes out. So everyone go home. I got someone. I I, I got someone for the job. And everyone was like, "Why? You didn't even speak to us. How maybe we're better? Why are you choosing him? He came last. It's not fair." He says, "Listen." In the lobby music you're listening to, in the in the in this in the there, there, there was Morse code playing, in the uh, in the and the Morse code said, um, get up, and go straight into my office, and don't ignore if anyone screams at you, ignore if the secretary screams at you, just straight go straight into my office. So, other people like we also heard the Morse code, we also heard the voice, we also heard the words, we also we heard that too. You, you, we also heard something. Mm -hmm. He said, but why don't you come? He said, I want someone who's able to ignore all the noise and to come, to arrive, to, be, to, move, to move, to move with what you heard. Avram didn't just hear, Avram heard in a way that he left, he went somewhere with what Hashem told him. He, he moved. Baruch Hashem, um, I had a personal Lechacha story. Um, I, I want to tell you all the Lechacha Non stories, <laughs> only, only, only things that make that will massage my ego is what, 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 what I will share. <laughs> um, a few years ago, it was about uh, 10 years ago, I took my children to the Beverly Hills Library. <laughs> I took my children to the Beverly Hills Library and I chose to look at the books and they asked me, Tati, is this book good? Is this book good? My knowledge of, of, of um, books goes back to my childhood. I did read a lot, a lot of comic books. My mother, Angazun, felt that if we read comic books, that would help us read other good books, which in fact worked. Anyways, but, um, but I'm looking at, I don't know these books. I know Beverly clearly. I know uh, Henry Huggins. I know Pippi Longstocking. I know uh, Nancy Drew. I know, I know um, um, uh, the Hardy Boys. That's the extent of my knowledge of, uh, that's it. That's what I remember. So I couldn't answer them. So I'm like, 
okay, we, you can't get these, you can't, well, hard, we heard Harry Potter, volume seven isn't good. Could we get one to six and eight to nine? Like, w- w- which ones? And so I, I realized, like, this is, not a, this is not okay. There should be a library for Jewish kids in Los Angeles, a big city. And, and um, I was thinking, like, that's not fair. You tell a kid television isn't okay. You tell a kid movies aren't okay. Shouldn't books be okay? Books are like, you know, it's, 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 it should be okay to have, to, the kids should be able to go into a place and get any book he wants. And, and so I realized we have to do something. We have to make a library for kids. And Baruch Hashem, I listened to that voice, and it wasn't easy. It was a lot of friction. I'm making this story very simple. It was a story that took many years. <clears throat> Baruch Hashem, we, we built the library. And Baruch Hashem, today we have almost 1,000 members. We have over 100,000 books taken out so far. So it, it, it was because... I felt in my, I felt that this is what Hashem wants to happen here, and I had to ignore a lot of other voices, and a lot of other, <laughs> I remember one of my son, my family was telling me about one dinner table, Tati, forget about the library, <laughs> it's not going to happen, stop, do something else. Again, to massage my ego, I'll tell you another story, my own personal life. <laughs> um, a few years ago, during COVID, uh, I thought there was an opportunity to invite kids from public school to come learn Judaism because they're home anyways. Let them come learn Judaism in our shul. I'm in between Judaism with one of the public school Zooms. And, and it worked. A lot of kids came. But when I did it, I realized that there's a lot of um, children that are not being helped by the over 30 private schools in town, either because they don't have money or because they don't have background in Judaism or because they have severe learning disabilities. So there's a lot in, in Massachusetts, where I'm from, in Worcester, it's a small town. My grandfather had the only religious day school, Orthodox day school, in town, and later the only day school in town. So he felt responsible. He had to be a tzaddik also, but you know, he wasn't a tzaddik. You're, you're the only guy in town. You, you, if this kid's not coming to your school, he's not going to any school. But in LA, it's not that sentiment. There's no feeling because, because <clears throat> there's another school. And I'll, 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 so I, I felt like I, ca- I can't close this. I can't close. I know these kids, are not, they're not going to go anywhere else. I have, to, I have to keep it open. And it's a struggle. It's not easy. Baruch Hashem, uh, it's, 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 we now have about 20 kids kind of harder. And it's, the word is getting out there. Or another child is called up, called up today. It's, it's getting out there. But the point is that in order to, to do this, what I have to do, I have to turn off all the noise and say, what does Hashem want me to do? And so I want to say, in, in this town, we don't get a chance to really listen to our Hashem. There's a lot of things we could do to fill up our time. But if you don't listen to that voice of your Hashem, what your Hashem is asking, what Hashem is asking you to do, you're going to feel empty inside. You might think it's a soft little voice. And this is a soft little voice. <laughs> but the truth is, you're not going to be happy until you listen to that voice. That, that's you. That's your, that, that soft little voice is you. Until you listen to that voice, you won't be satisfied. You're not, you're not, not you won't be satisfied as your Nisham won't be satisfied. You as a human being won't be satisfied. You have to pay attention when your Nisham is asking. And it might be something that sounds very, very small. And it might not have the friction that, 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 that I'm, I'm giving you these, these, these heroic stories of friction, and uh, making, but it might not have the friction. Let's think about the first man, as we were discussing this morning, but Adam, Adam Rish. Adam Rish had a very simple test. Hashem told him in three hours, you're going to make Kiddush on the, on the wine of the tree of knowledge. In three hours, Adam Rish knew that he would make Kiddush on the wine of the, of the grapes of the tree of knowledge, and he didn't overcome this test. Why? Because it was such an important thing for him. It was, such, it was so important for him, it was so important, therefore the evil inclination tried so hard to, to, to distract him. When something is your mission uniquely, there's all the reasons in the world that, that it should be so easy, and yet it's hard. Why is it hard? Not because it's hard, but because it's yours, because it's your mitzvah. There are some people in your life, in my life, that need your compliment. They need your good word. And lechacha means that you go away from yourself, and you think, what does Hashem ask me to do for people in my life? Maybe it means to stop a moment a day and say something nice and kind to your spouse, to your children who, who really need it. It's like a, like a, like a, like 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 a, a breath of fresh air, like like a cold water and a dry parched soul. So lechacha means that you exercise your neshama's muscles. If you stop and you listen to your soul every day, you stop and think about where you where you are, and where you're meant to be, and what you what opportunities you have, and how to use your resources. You you get better and better. At exercising your soul and, and get you, let me say two things about about recognizing what's a voice of your soul, what's a voice of Hashem to you. Lechacha. Number one is that it's not about Hashem calls you to go out of your comfort zone, to go out of something that you were doing before, and to go and to go deeper. That's number one. It's Hashem is asking you to go out of your comfort. If they hear that voice and you go out of your comfort zone, pay attention. Number two, 
It's not about you. It's about something good that's going to happen. It might just go good for you, but you're going to start learning Torah more. You're going to dive in better. But you're going to do something which is Hashem wants you to do. There's a story that happened many times in the time of the Alter Rebbe. There are a few versions of the story, only because it happened many times. It's, it's not many versions of the same story. The Rebbe said it's, it's a story that happened many times. That's why there are many versions. What was the story? The story happened many times. This guy comes to the Alter Rebbe. Rebbe, I need to pay off these creditors. Rebbe, I have to marry off my daughters. Rebbe, I need this and I need that. What should I do? And what does Alter Rebbe say? The Alter Rebbe said, you only ask what you need. You're not asking what's needed from you. You're asking what you need, not asking what's needed from you. The previous Rebbe said the story on one of these occasions. The gentleman the Alter was speaking to simply fainted. He fainted because what the Alter Rebbe said to him was a, was a real lechacha. It was a complete departure of what he, where he was. He, the previous Rebbe said he was a person who was an excellent character. He was a very refined person. But the, what the kind of ask the Alter was giving him, to go away from what you need and think what Hashem is asking of you, was was a dramatic change. He wasn't ready for that. And that's that's what perhaps I mean, when the Rebbe Hashem is crying, sing lechacha, what melted the the heart of the Rebbe Hashem? What is that? It's it's we know it's tzaddikim. We don't know, but on a personal level, it's 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 the idea of going away from all the external external things and 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 listening to Hashem and and, and listening to inner voice. There is a at what point did Hashem tell Avram lechacha? Talmud says, Avon is walking around the world. Talmud gives, gives an example. Someone's walking around, the, around a, a city, and he sees his palace, and he sees a palace is lit up. And he says, maybe this palace has no owner. Why is it lit up? And all of a sudden, the owner of the palace comes right out at him and says, I'm the owner of the palace. That's what it says in the Talmud, in the Medrash. There are two interpretations of this. First interpretation is, the palace is the world. And Avram is wondering, the world is a beautiful world. The world is luminous. The world is lit up. I don't mean like in the Gen Z uh, way it's lit. It's, 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 but it's, it's, it's an amazing order in the world. Newton. They say about Newton, that Newton, I didn't Google this, I didn't fact check it, but I heard about Newton is, is that Newton um, was so astonished by the order he saw in creation that he came to realize that, that, that there must be a God that made this order. Like Avram Avinu. Avram Avinu realized that if the sun was under its own control, then why is it always rising and setting at the same time? Why, why is it such an order? One day it will rise, one day it won't rise. He realized that, 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 that there is a force, that there's someone behind everything. Avram Avinu looked at the world, he realized that there, 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 there's, the, the world has, how could it be that there's no creator? There's such an amazing design. That's Avram Avinu's perspective. And therefore, Hashem revealed Himself to Avram at the age of three years old. Because Avram was looking and asking, and Hashem showed him. That's one interpretation. There's another interpretation. Other interpretation is that Avram saw the palace was burning. He saw the palace was burning. What does it mean the palace was burning? Avram looks at the world. He looks at all the murder, and all the treachery, and all the anarchy, and all the confusion, and all the anxiety. And Avram's like... What's going on? How could this world have a, a, a creator that's governing when there's so much terrible things going on? What does Hashem answer Avram? I'm the owner. The paradox I create. Why did I create the paradox? Because Hashem wants us, to, even though there's a Shofan Arach, and even though there's all these kind of customs we're supposed to do, but nevertheless Hashem wants us to figure out a needle of it. Hashem wants us on our own to say, I want to do what you want, Hashem. Hashem wants each of us to turn to Hashem and say, I want to go with you, Hashem. It's not, it's not about um, getting it done only. Hashem wants us to, to, to summon from within ourselves this, 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 to hear the voice of Hashem, lechacha, that I want to go with you, Hashem. And just like Avram was one person, so too when the last Jew arrived tonight back home, and, 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 and now all of Israel can pray for rain, so too it's, it's, uh, Hashem is asking each of us individually. And, and, and for Hashem, you're the only one. You're the only one. I am the only one. No, you're also, it's a paradox, but that's a reality. You're the only one. Hashem is waiting for you to come home, and the rain is not going to come down because you have to come home. And and, and similarly, <coughs> the Abish is waiting for us to do that last mitzvah, the last word, good thought, last good word, last good action, the tip that's going to be Mashiach. L'chaim, 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 l I'm taking it in a very dramatic way. Daniel, I'm scaring you. Let me make it less dramatic. 
I'm begging like all or nothing. Think to Musr. It's not all or nothing. Go a little bit towards towards Asha. A little bit. A little bit means you add five minutes to Torah. You add, you add five minutes to your davening. It means you, you say a compliment to someone once a day. You do something going towards where Hashem is asking you to go. And uh, <laughs> I'll give an example about the library and the school. It also wasn't, uh, it was like a little bit here, a little bit there. Ya'inva, ya'unva, pa'in, bala. L'chayin, l'chayin, l'chayin.